Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is day 265, Tuesday, November the 28th, 2017. Wow, already November 28th, man. Where did this month go? Question. Did Crooked Hillary, the rotten Reverend Clinton, order the surveillance on Donald Trump and his team? Would the rotten Reverend Clinton order surveillance on someone? Has she ever ordered surveillance on anyone? Well, the answers to those questions, my friends, are yes, yes, and yes. In 1990, the rotten reverend asked Vince Foster to spy on her husband, Bill. She wanted to know how vulnerable he would be in a presidential race. Foster then hired Jerry Parks, an Arkansas private investigator. Parks had worked for Foster before. Foster used to pay Parks $1,000 per trip to deliver large sums of money from the airport in Mena, Arkansas to Vince Foster, who would be waiting at the local Kmart parking lot. After Vince Foster's death on July 20th, 1993, <clears throat> Park, uh, Park Park's home was burglarized in a sophisticated operation that involved cutting the telephone lines and disarming the alarm systems. The dossier that Parks had put together on Bill Clinton was stolen. Two months later, Jerry Parks was driving home from dinner when a Chevy Caprice rolled up next to him and opened fire with semi-automatic rifles. Parks skidded to a stop, then one man jumped out of the Chevy Caprice and unloaded a clip from a 9mm handgun into Parks' chest at point-blank range. Several witnesses observed the execution-style killing. Mrs. Parks was later told by an official at the state police that the hit was ordered by Buddy Young, who was chief of President, or at that time, Governor Clinton's security detail. Would the rotten Reverend Clinton order surveillance, or would she ask someone to put together a dossier on her opponent? Well, it appears from her history she's done both. She likes those dossiers. They sure come in handy. And it appears that she does like to spy on people, including her own husband. Well, there you go. I guess you can consider Mr. Parks another one of those people who died, only in this case, not from, you know, unusual circumstances. Uh, this, in fact, happened with half a dozen people standing nearby uh, where this all went down, and they watched this happen. There were multiple witnesses to this murder. I have a question for you. We have all these sex charges and sex allegations and all this stuff happening. Obviously, the stuff happening out in Hollywood is one thing, but what we see happening now in D.C. with Frankengroper and others... John Conyers and others, it makes you kind of want to ask this question that, wait a minute, for all this time they've had this secret uh, payment system by which they pay off people who make sexual misconduct allegations against members of Congress. They've paid out over $17 million, 265 or some odd claims. This makes me ask the question, why so many female members of Congress have not spoken up about this thing that they know exists? Why haven't we heard anything from these so-called feminist leaders, such as Madam Botox, Nancy Pelosi, Diane, turn in your guns, Mr. and Mrs. America Feinstein, Debbie Blabbermouth Wasserman Schultz, Mad Maxine Waters, and all the rest. 
they have all known about this program that they have in Congress where they can use money that's been budgeted to their congressional offices to pay off s claims of sexual allegations against members or their staff members. Not a peep from any of these females in Congress, not Republican members of Congress who are female, not Democrat members of Congress who are female, many of whom are hardcore feminist, not a single word. They've allowed all these women, these young girls that work as interns in Washington, D.C., to be sexually harassed, abused, and God knows what else. And these women in Congress have known about it for a very, very long time, and they've never said a word. Do you think it's possible that some of these sex allegations and settlements that have been made, do you think there has been any made against female members of Congress who may have been assaulting or sexually harassing any men? Or, or maybe other men or other women for that, for that matter. How about the rotten Reverend Clinton? She was in the Senate. Did anyone ever remember hearing about the rotten Reverend standing up for women who were facing these types of issues while working in D.C. around the Capitol? I don't. Just an observation and a question. Because you see all these female uh, members of Congress coming out now and all of a sudden they act like they're so concerned. But they have known the whole time that this program has existed. And I just wonder if we would find, if we ever get to that list, and believe me, there are journalists digging and there are people pressing to get that list released. Trump has said it should be released. Be very interesting if we ever see that list once it's, once it's released and see if there's any female members of Congress who have paid any sexual settlement suits. It'll also be interesting to see if there's any male members of Congress who've paid out uh, any money to these settlements who have been accused of harassing men. We definitely need to get that list of names, don't we? Net neutrality. Dead. Dead and gone. Gone, gone. Thank you, President Trump. And net neutrality will stay gone as long as Trump is president. Now, net neutrality gets into a bunch of uh, complex stuff. I'm not going to go into it now. I'll just give you what net neutrality was all about. Net neutrality was about the left wing getting control and censoring conservative talk on the Internet. That's what it was all about. That was the driving force behind net neutrality to censor people who are on the right, center-right, libertarians, populists, nationalists, conservatives, whatever. That's what net neutrality was all about, to silence conservative voices on the internet. It was buried in a lot of bullshit, but at the end of the day, that's what net neutrality was all about. And it's dead, gone. Thank you, President Trump. FBI sources are telling Roger Stone that there has not been, uh, that there's just been, that, let me start over. <laughs> FBI, there's an FBI source telling Roger Stone that there has just been launched a criminal investigation to look at the relationship between Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein and whether or not Epstein was supplying underage girls to Harvey Weinstein. Of course, we just talked about Jeffrey Epstein. He's the guy who had the Lolita Express and owns the uh, uh, Orgy Island in the Virgin Islands. But what's most interesting about this story is that these FBI sources are telling Roger Stone that there was a middleman who put Epstein and Weinstein together so that Epstein could furnish Weinstein with underage girls. Now, this is basically an FBI investigation that's recently been launched, according to an FBI source of Roger Stone. But they're suggesting that the middleman who put the two together, none other than William Jefferson Blythe Clinton, the serial rapist and husband 
of the rotten Reverend Clinton who spent $1.2 billion, cheated, and still lost. Should I talk about this story about the Secret Service agents talking about what happened after Hillary had that episode at the, which was in fact a seizure at the 9-11 ceremony where they talk about having to take her back to Chelsea's and clean her up? Nah, let's not talk about that. Let's move on. William Campbell. Well, today was the big day, wasn't it? for the FBI informant, William Campbell, to go behind closed doors and start talking and showing members of Congress who are on this uh, joint committee some of the evidence that he has regarding the Uranium One scandal, the cover-up, and the money that was laundered through the Clinton Foundation and the Global Clinton Global Initiative. Two things were happening on the House side today regarding this. The first thing, they've got two things, had two things going. First, they were supposed to have hearings where they were supposed to be given by the Justice Department basically the play-by-play -play of what actually happened in this criminal investigation, how the criminal investigation got started, what the results were, who went to jail, what did they do, what kind of crimes did they discover, and this and that and the other thing. So basically an overview of the actual uh, criminal invest investigation that went on regarding the um, kickbacks and bribery and money laundering and all the other things, extortion that were going on during this uh, Uranium One thing. So that was the first thing that was supposed to happen and I believe that was open hearings where the members of this uh, joint committees were supposed to have gotten informed about what happened with this whole Uranium One investigation, including probably talking about the uh, three people who got sent to jail and are, I assume, still in jail uh, over that. So that was the first thing that was supposed to happen. The second thing that was supposed to happen is Mr. Campbell, the FBI informant, was supposed to appear today to begin telling his story and presenting the evidence uh, to other members who are part of a joint committee that have been set up to uh, hear his testimony, take a look at his evidence, and all that stuff. So both of these things were supposed to happen today. I really haven't had a chance to check the newswire uh, to see if there's any stories that have come out. Um, I would expect over the na next couple of days, if he did show up to that hearing, that we should start learning a little bit about what he's telling uh, these, con these uh, congressional members and the joint committee about the information he's got. Now, I believe with all that he has, all the tapes and all the um, video and all the documents that he's got, apparently it's a large volume of things that he has. It's going to take some time for him to go through and give his verbal explanation of everything. And then, of course, it's going to take some time for the Congress uh, to review the materials. At some point, I would expect that we will be able to get some kind of a transcript. There might be some redactions, but for the most part, we should get a lot of the uh, Q&A between Mr. Campbell and this joint uh, session of Congress that met behind closed doors. We should learn a lot about what he is telling them. And if I remember correctly, Jim Jordan and Ron DeSantis both stated that once they had these closed hearings and got this information and looked at all this, that they were going to take and digest it all, and then they were going to come back and have open hearings where they could have the Q&A session and basically walk the public and the media in an open session through the series of events, the play-by-play, -play, the TikTok, if you will, that went on during his time as an undercover FBI informant working uh, on this um, case, of which I think there were multiple cases, actually. So that is what was supposed to happen today. And again, we haven't really heard. I haven't really had a chance to check the news wires to see um, whether or not anything's come out about that. But I expect in the next couple of days, we'll start getting some, some bits and pieces of it. But at some point, we should actually see an open hearing with Mr. Campbell. And at some point, even prior to that, we should probably get a transcript and uh, I assume there are journalists right now 
working very hard to get a copy of the transcript, and I'm sure they should have success doing that. Um, they might want to wait till he's completely done giving his verbal pitch before they do it. Um, but uh, at some point we should, and I would think it won't take too long that we should get the transcript. It'll be very interesting and uh, most likely very damning for the Rotten Reverend, her husband, anyone who's involved in the Clinton Foundation, Mr. Gustrup, the Russians, uh, the Podesta brothers, um, and of course Mueller and Rosenstein and McCabe, who were also involved in really the cover-up of this thing. Now, I stumbled onto something. This is kind of interesting because we're talking about William F. Campbell, the FBI informant. On Saturday, or maybe it was Friday night, and even on Saturday, I started noticing a lot of people, um, a lot of different sites that I check out from time to time, talking about this story about William J. Campbell having already had one attempt on his life since his name was made public by the Justice Department. And I'm not sure why they did that at the Justice Department. You generally wouldn't do something like that, but, and I don't even think it was a leak. I mean, I just think they were probably asked, oh, do you, who's the FBI informant that we're talking about? And that, I think they just gave the name. Oh, what's well, this, uh, William J. Campbell. Now, maybe they thought it was out there or it was gonna be out there or it was gonna be released or whatever, I don't know. But uh, very surprised that, that, uh, that his name came out that day, but that's how we found out about him. Uh, of course, Reuters, uh, I believe that's how Reuters said that they got the name and that's how they were able to contact him and do that interview in Reuters was the fact that they, they appear, apparently got the name from the Justice Department. Now, according to the story that's going around the internet on quite a few sites, I could never find actually the original site. I really don't know and I'm not even 100% sure if this is a true story, but it's certainly making the rounds and it's on a lot of sites that generally do not post a lot of fake news. Um, so it's worth telling you about. This is apparently the accounting from Mr. Campbell about what he experienced shortly after his name was released to the public. <clears throat> Says FBI informant William Campbell was telling friends that since his name was made public, he has experienced an assassination attempt. William D. Campbell was hiking behind his house in the woods, behind his house, when he saw a man moving through the woods, woods that are essentially on his property, behind his property, and that this man was carrying a rifle. Campbell, who himself was also carrying a handgun, brandished his weapon, pointed it at the man, and held him in a gaze, making eye contact until the man turned and disappeared into the woods, heading towards the highway. Hmm. So, there's a lot of people who don't want Mr. Campbell to tell what he knows. The Rotten Reverend Clinton certainly doesn't want that to come out. A lot of her friends don't want that to come out. Obama doesn't want that to come out. Mueller doesn't want that to come out. Comey doesn't want that to come out. And all the people who, who protect them. We also have the Russians that probably don't want that to come out. Although the Russians, the Russians do not like to use Russian assets to commit assassinations on U.S. soil. Generally speaking, if the Russians want to hit an American, they want to hit him when he's out of the country. If they have to hit him in the country, they generally use an American sniper, an American assassin, not a Russian. Now, we don't know if this man was Russian or not. Mr. Campbell chased him out of the woods by pointing his gun at him and staring him down. But the fact that it's being reported that this FBI informant is telling some friends that this event went down and he's reporting it as an assassination attempt it certainly makes you question you know what's going on here but based on that and putting that into the proper context I do hope that Mr. Campbell made it to Congress today and I would say to Mr. Campbell the best thing that you can do for yourself for your own protection is to get it out 
get everything you've got out because once it's out there it's much more difficult well first of all the damage is done the only thing that can happen then is a revenge hit right now it may be a hit to stop him from getting the evidence out there but his attorney has probably just about every bit of his documentation she's probably that, that documentation and all that evidence is probably in her custody and it's probably not in her office it's probably somewhere uh, under lock and key pretty secure we also know that John Solomon and Sarah Carter have also received quite a bit of information from that attorney and from Mr. Campbell himself. He's been um, quite good about sharing some of the information already. But the very best thing he could do is to get that information into the hands of the Congress and go and tell his story as soon as possible, as loudly as possible. That way, at least ways, he, he, he doesn't have to worry about someone hitting him to keep him from testifying. Now, of course, he still faces the retaliation, a revenge hit, because he did come out. And, of course, that will always be with him. You know, I mean, he may have to spend the rest of his life practicing some very good personal security. He might even have to hire a security person around him. He sure made a hell of a lot of money uh, in that little uh, deal he was involved in there, so maybe he's got the money to afford it. I don't know how much a personal security bodyguard costs, but probably hundred grand a year. Somewhere in that range. So yeah, he, he should probably be uh, uh, very careful, but he needs to get out there as soon as possible. The worst thing you can be is to be someone having information and you sit on it. Because as long as you're sitting on it, it's not out there. It gives the people who might be harmed by the information a very big incentive to take you out before you can talk. Once you've talked, you know, now you're out there and, and people are very paying very close attention. So if you do get hit after you've talked, it doesn't take people long to figure out who might have been behind it. Question. Did Senator Magoo contribute to the fund to help bring about the dossier. Did Magoo help fund Christopher Steele? You know, I've been looking into his right-hand man, Mr. Carter, and watching this civil suit in Florida against BuzzFeed, and we now know, as I reported last week, that the judge down there in Florida has granted the request by Mr. Gubarev's attorneys to get a full uh, deposition of BuzzFeed, the three people there at BuzzFeed, um, the guy who started, I forget his name, but also the editor and, and one of the uh, journalists there at BuzzFeed, all three of them are going to be deposed, but also they granted uh, his request to have Christopher Steele deposed. Now Christopher Steele was already deposed in the UK suit by Mr. Gubarev's attorneys, but they want to do the same thing here because it's really a different, slightly different uh, case with different questions. So the judge has granted that. Now in the UK, they're fighting that. Uh, Steele's attorneys are fighting that. But whether or not they'll be successful in fighting that in the Florida case, I don't know. We just have to keep watching. But more and more, it's looking like Steele's attorneys are still wanting to suggest that there were very few people that had, ac had access to the dossier and that one of them certainly had to be the ones who leaked it to BuzzFeed. There's a very small number of people who would have had a copy of that who could have leaked it to BuzzFeed. And they keep insinuating it's very likely that, that it could have been Mr. Magoo because Christopher Steele is staunchly denying it. Glenn Simpson has denied it. He's even said that BuzzFeed contacted him and asked him for the dossier and he refused. Now, another question is, was Magoo paying towards the dossier or was he being paid? I think it might be a good idea to have a look at some banking records from Senator Magoo and also from his foundation. In the next few days I am going to be laying out some bio background information on Mr. Kramer which I have been looking into which is quite interesting. Quite interesting. 
leading me to believe that Mr. Kramer is not just some idle player lackey that McCain calls on to come over and uh, take him pick up his dry cleaning. That Mr. Kramer is a lot more of a player in, in deep state operations, and he is a Russian expert who speaks fluent Russian, has quite a background and a relationship with Russians. Makes you wonder, opens up a lot of questions. So I'm going to be digging in in the next couple of days as soon as the news cycle slows down to try to look more into Mr. Kramer. He might be a person that no one's paying very much attention to that one of us should be paying attention to. Because as I was looking into his bio on Sunday afternoon, finding some things that I didn't know because we're being led to believe he's just, you know, this helping hand to John McCain, but he's much, much more than that. And I'll be revealing that to you here in the next few days, along with a different viewpoint of how we should look at this role that Senator Magoo might have played in the dossier. It's clear that he, like Christopher Steele, wants to distance himself from it as far as he can, as far away as he can. And he's also wanting to distance himself pretty far from the rotten Reverend Clinton, despite the fact that they're very close friends, that he voted for her, that he supported her, and he was very integral in working, I'm sure, with the Clintons in preparing this dossier. I find it very difficult to believe that Senator Magoo, sitting on the Senate Intelligence Committee, having very close uh, ties to John Brennan of the CIA would not know who was behind the dossier. He sent his right-hand man, Mr. Kramer, over to the UK to talk to Christopher Steele personally. Don't you think that Christopher Steele would have known who was behind the dossier? Do you think that James Comey would have known who was behind the dossier? Certainly Glenn Simpson had to know who was behind the dossier. How would John McCain not know? He's on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He would certainly have been curious. He didn't just go to this meeting in Halifax and hear this stuff and go, oh yeah, man, I'm into that. Oh, that sounds great. Hey, I'm just going to send my guy over there. He's going to get the stuff. You give him the stuff. You give him the dirt. He's going to come back and give it to me, and I'm just going to give it to Comey, and then I'm just going to forget all about it. I don't think so. No. No, 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 no. No, that's not, that's not going to work. Senator, Senator Magoo is on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He's got access to all kinds of intel. He's also got a direct line to the CIA director, John Brennan, who's a close friend of the Rotten Reverend Clinton, probably connected in some way to Fusion GPS because we know that they have sources within the intel community. Senator Magoo is up to his eyeballs in this and I find it very difficult to believe that he's as naive. He's trying to play it off like, yeah, I heard about this dossier uh, when I was in Canada. I sent Kramer over to England to get some information. He came back and uh, I got the dossier and I just passed it on to the FBI and that's basically all there is to it. No, no, no. He, you know, he would be far too curious. He would be asking way, way, way more questions. He would be very, very intimately involved in this if he made that kind of an effort. And the question is, did he pay for that dossier? I mean, let's face it, everyone else had to pay for the dossier, did they not? The rotten Reverend Clinton had to pay. She had to pay Mr. Elias to pay G Fusion GPS, to pay Christopher Steele, to pay intermediaries, to pay alleged Russians. Everybody was getting paid. You wanted the dossier, it was going to cost you. The only people who were going to get some of it for free was journalists who would print it. But John McCain wasn't a journalist. He was just an interested, another interested party in getting his hands on it. And why did John McCain need to get his hands on it? Christopher Steele was a former agent who has close contact with the FBI. Why would Christopher Steele need John McCain to give it to the FBI? Christopher Steele, as we just learned, met two times with the FBI in Rome, two times in June and September, and basically gave him all the memos which later became the dossier. Why did they need Glenn Simpson to send it to Magoo? They could have just sent it right directly to Comey, which I'm sure they did. They could have hand-walked it on over to John Brennan at the CIA. 
They could have dropped it right in the lap of the rotten Reverend Clinton or up the ass crack of John Podesta. Who knows? Why did they need John McCain? It didn't. It was didn't need him at all. What did he do? He got a copy of the dossier and gave it to the FBI director, so he says. Well, the FBI director was already getting uh, the memos that would later make up the dossier all throughout the summer. His FBI people had two personal briefings with Christopher Steele in Rome, Italy. So why did John McCain need to get involved? And did John McCain, did, did uh, I mean, let's face it, if Christopher Steele and Glenn Simpson are working for a client, Glenn Simpson's working for his client, which is Fusion GPS, who's working for his client, which is Mark Elias representing the rotten Reverend Clinton, she is the owner of that dossier. She's the one paying for it. All those people being paid, all that money is coming out of the pocket of the rotten Reverend Clinton. Everyone else was paying. Are we supposed to believe that John McCain was just given it for free because his right-hand man made the trip? Because somehow he was going to be able to get it to Comey? Comey was getting it anyway. You see, there's a lot of questions and nobody wants to bring up Senator Magoo. No one wants to ask what his role in it was. But I think it's time to take a look at the bank records of, the, of, of Magoo. And he has a couple foundations, one of which Mr. Kramer heads. I think we need to look at the financial transactions that were going on with the McCain Institute that's being run by Mr. Kramer. We're going to be talking about Mr. Kramer in the next couple of days. And I think you're going to be very surprised at what we learn. Stay tuned. Speaking of McCain, he too is now fed up with the rotten Reverend Clinton. Her close friend, John McCain, who's been by her side the whole time, defending her at every turn. But finally, even McCain has had enough. And quite honestly, he wants her to go away. She is only going to continue to stir things up and end up getting him mixed up in things he doesn't want to be mixed up in that he's already mixed up in that he doesn't want people digging into. And he knows the more the, the rotten reverend's out there stirring up a shitstorm, the better chance there is that he's going to get sucked up into it with her. That's why he wants her to go away. But it's just funny that as close as those two are and as much as they collaborated, what good buddies they are, that yesterday McCain went on a little bit of a tweet storm and he responded to the Rotten Reverend Clinton's tweet by saying uh, what's the effing point? Get over it. So he's talking about the Rotten Reverend constantly complaining about how she was had the election stolen, how the it was rigged against her, the Russians took over the election or whatever and McCain's basically saying look I got my ass kicked just as bad as you did by Barack Obama. <laughs> I know what it's like to lose. It sucks, but you know what? You get over it. And that's what he's telling the rotten Clinton. What's the effing point, he tweets. Get over it. So even the rotten, you know, when the rotten Reverend Clinton, when she loses the neocons, that's all she's got. That's all she's got. The corporate Democrats want her to go away. The progressives despise her. Obviously, conservatives despise her. Trump supporters despise her. No one likes her. The only one she had, still clinging on, still giving her a little support, a little moral support was the neocons. And now the neocon of neocons, Senator Magoo, has just told her to get over it. And of course, we couldn't uh, leave without talking about the Thanksgiving tweet from Trump, where Trump on Thanksgiving proposed, uh, uh, put out a tweet where he proposed that there be a contest to see who's the most fake news and to present the, the winner with a trophy. <laughs> oh, he's awesome. Alrighty, folks, thanks for tuning in. That's Towergate, day 265, Tuesday, 11 28, 2017, November 28, 2017. Thank you so much for tuning in. You guys have a good night. Bye.